In the year 1943, a man named Ingvar Kamprad used money given to him by his father to start his very own furniture shop. This store, named Ingvar Kamprad from Elm Tree Agunari, would eventually be abbreviated to IKEA and grow into the internationally beloved company that we all know of today. Though the stocks, logos and reach of the company has changed steadily throughout the years, this furniture store turned household name is forever associated with moving and new beginnings. It's hard to imagine that such a common store could become the setting of something truly horrible. It's hard to imagine that crimes like murder could happen in the middle of such a populated public space. However, on the 10th of August in 2015, this notion would step out of the realm of imagining and into a very real and heartbreaking reality. Because it was on that day that a double homicide would happen, right out in the open, in the middle of a heavy populated show floor of an unsuspecting IKEA in Sweden. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. On the 25th of February 1979, Abraham Ukbakbir was born in the country of Eritrea. For those unfamiliar, Eritrea is a small country in the northeastern region of Africa. It shares its borders with Sudan, Djibouti and Ethiopia and has a large coastline touching the Red Sea. Eritrea has a rich and vast cultural history, boasting significant evidence and history pertaining to human evolution with human remains dating back over one million years ago being found in the region. Though many religions and cultures have taken roots in the country over the centuries, today a majority of Eritreans are followers of the Christian or Islamic faiths. Because of this, Abraham was born into a Christian family, and his faith being an important and integral part of his upbringing and identity, now, despite our best efforts in research, there is not much publicly available information about Abraham's life in Eritrea. However, we do know that due to political tensions within the country, Abraham eventually chose to immigrate away from his home country. These tensions, the details of which are far too complex and out of our scope to be discussed within this video, were decidedly dire enough that several countries throughout Europe stepped in to offer asylum for many immigrants from Eritrea. And so, in 2012, Abraham left Eritrea and travelled to Italy. He gained a permit to reside in Italy and quickly found a job working as a fisherman on the coast. Abraham would ultimately remain in Italy for two to three months before deciding that he would prefer to live elsewhere in Europe. You see, at the time, Abraham had family in Sweden and had heard that they'd found it to be a nice place to immigrate to. In 2017, the Washington Post wrote an article that listed Sweden as the best country to be an immigrant in, noting that in years past, those who immigrated to Sweden found it to be safe and a friendly country. Many people were able to get their visas and find work quite easily, and noted that learning Swedish was not too difficult to handle. And so, because of this, Abraham decided to join his family in Sweden and enter the country at some point in April of 2013. Now, when Abraham arrived in Sweden in April of 2013, he once again began the process to gain a residence permit. Though many before him had easily secured their permits to remain in Sweden, the process for Abraham was not quite as seamless. From the beginning, Abraham had not properly done the applications and taken the other necessary steps in immigrating properly for the type of residence permit that he was hoping to receive. These paperwork type missteps led to various issues with his visa process, and by mid-2015, the situation was not looking good. By this point, Abraham had been living in Sweden for nearly a year and a half, and was well into the swing of his new life there. In visa meetings in the earlier months of the year, Abraham was informed that he would likely not receive the asylum visa he was after, 
will therefore be able to remain in Sweden. Though he had known for quite a while that he would likely have to return to either Italy or Eritrea and could be deported at any moment, Abraham continued his life as usual. Because he'd not received word that he was to be deported or otherwise forced to leave by immigration, and so Abraham held on to his hopes that he'd be able to remain in the country. This blissful ignorance would not last for much longer. In August of 2015, Abraham was informed that he was to come into the city of Vastaros to attend a meeting in regards to his right to remain in Sweden. And so on Saturday the 15th of August 2015, he boarded a bus from the lodgings that he lived in and travelled to Vastaros, still somewhat hopeful that things would work out for him. The meeting was long, and ultimately confirmed Abraham's worst fears. Abraham was scheduled to be deported from Sweden and returned to Italy, which was where he still had a right to residence. He was outraged, crushed, and in disbelief that his asylum visa had been denied and that he would be removed from the country. He left the immigration office, but did not yet return to his lodgings in Arboga, which was the city where he'd been living for the past four months. Instead, Abraham made a decision. A decision based on his outrage and heartbreak. Abraham wanted to make someone suffer. Around this same time, another man from the same lodgings as Abraham, named Johannes, was in Vastaros to buy himself a brand new mobile phone. Johannes, unlike Abraham, had his visa confirmed and he was preparing to finalise his right to stay in Sweden. Abraham was aware of this fact and was aware that Johannes was planning to be in town at around the same time that he left his visa meeting. And so he reached out to Johannes and offered to take him shopping with him at IKEA, which was a store that Johannes was unfamiliar with. When Johannes asked about this store, Abraham lied, telling him that it was like a shopping mall and that he'd easily be able to get and find a cell phone there. And because of this, Johannes agreed to join him and Abraham bought them both bus tickets to the stop that was located just outside of the store. No one, Johannes included, could have known what was about to unfold. The two of them arrive at the Ikea between midday and one, and Abraham guides Johannes through the store. Johannes describes seeing a food court and different areas that he interprets as stores, and felt that Abraham was making good on his word. Abraham skips a large portion of the store and immediately enters the homeware section. This section of the store contains various goods that you'd need to keep your home running efficiently, such as supplies for your kitchen or bathroom. In the section containing kitchenware, Abraham spots the thing he'd come to Ikea looking for, the display case containing the kitchen knives. Abraham picks up a cutting board before heading towards the display case. The knives in the display were wrapped in thick plastic packaging, something that is expected when publicly displaying knives for sale. He is seen here on CCTV as he takes two different knives from the display before walking off camera. Abraham walks into the corner of the aisle and begins to rip the knives from their protective packaging. He manages to do so quickly and discreetly, with Johannes stating later that he didn't even realise what Abraham was doing. Which, by the way, I can never get into those packaging that they put on knives or scissors, so I have no idea how we managed to get into them so easily. With the two knives free from their packaging and hidden from view by the cutting board they had picked up before, Abraham is now on the hunt. He wanders the homewares section looking for somewhere he felt shows the qualities that he was looking for to take his misplaced anger out on. Specifically, Abraham is looking for someone that he decides, quote, looks Swedish. Johannes follows closely behind, still unaware of the situation that is slowly beginning to unfold. It isn't long before the two men come across two people that fit Abraham's bill, 55-year-old Carola Herlin and her 27-year-old son, Emil Herlin. The pair are looking at various goods in a different aisle of the homeware section when they are spotted. Abraham doesn't hesitate for a moment. He pulls the knives from behind the cutting board he is concealing them with and rushes towards them. He first attacks Carola, stabbing her multiple times with one of the stolen knives, causing fatal injuries. 
Carola fights back, but eventually collapses to the ground, the knife still lodged where she'd been stabbed. Abraham then goes after Emil, who also manages to fend Abraham off for a few moments before becoming overpowered. Emil suffers the same fate as his mother, sustaining fatal injuries from the stabbing before falling to the ground. Chaos erupts in the store. People are yelling and screaming, rushing to leave the area as the attack progresses. Amidst the chaos, Johannes runs alongside the other witnesses, rushing to leave the Ikea in fear that they might also become victims of the stabbing. Many people are evacuated by staff and security towards the bus stop outside, while some others are confused by the commotion, with some rushing to the aid of Carola and Emil. One of these brave onlookers is a woman named Janice, who is a working nurse at the time. Janice hears the attacks as they happen, and upon seeing Carola on the ground, rushes to provide first aid. Though unfortunately, when Janice kneels to check Carola's vitals, she finds that she tragically has already passed away. Janice then checks on Emil, who sadly had also already passed away due to the extent of his injuries. It was at this point that a security guard approaches Janice to check in on the condition of the mother and son, and upon the security guard being told the news of their passing, he asks her a question that made her heart sink. Have you checked on the third person? She rushes to the area where the security tells her the third injured person is, and immediately gets to work assessing his injuries. The man had been stabbed in the stomach, but his wounds wouldn't be fatal, as they were treatable. Janice stays beside the man until the ambulance arrives on the scene, relieved that at least one person would survive the ordeal. However, what she doesn't know is that the man she knelt beside was none other than Abraham Ugbagabir, the killer of the two people that she'd just tried to save. The investigation into this case was quite unusual. While Abraham was in the hospital receiving treatment under police supervision, he was very upfront when responding to questions that the investigators had. When asked what happened in the homeware section only hours before, he calmly explained everything. He explained to investigators his visa rejection and his anger towards the system due to it. He explained that he picked out individuals to attack that he felt looked like Swedish nationals, as he wanted to use them as an outlet for his anger. He told investigators that, quote, I wanted to make people understand me. Investigators then inquired about his wound, asking him to describe how he'd been injured, and again, Abraham was very direct with his response. He told investigators that after he had murdered Emil, they had run with the crowd and then panicked. And once he'd really sunk in what he'd just done, he turned the knife he had just used to kill Emil on himself, hoping to die before being taken in by the authorities. He was obviously unsuccessful in that attempt, and felt now that there was no use in trying to deceive the police. The investigators then asked Abraham about Johannes and his involvement in the attacks. When first responders arrived on the scene, Johannes was outside with the others who had left the IKEA when Abraham began his attacks, and as the police began to question the witnesses in the crowd, Johannes was quickly pointed out. Many of them remembered seeing Abraham and Johannes together mere moments before the stabbings, scared that he himself might somehow be armed. Police arrested Johannes outside of the Ikea, right next to the very same bus stop that he'd arrived at before. Abraham explains to the investigators how he'd met Johannes, and eventually admitted that Johannes knew nothing of what he was going to do in the store. When the police asked why he'd invited Johannes along, if he hadn't planned to involve him in his plot, his response was nothing short of evil. Abraham originally intended to claim him as a conspirator. Why? Because he was jealous. Abraham admitted to the investigators that he hated that Johanna's application for a visa had been accepted when his own had been denied. In his mind, he and Johannes had an equal right to remain in Sweden. Both men were from the same country with similar pasts, but only one had been accepted. In Abraham's mind, it was an obviously unfair decision. However, as I mentioned before, Abraham had not taken the proper steps in the immigration process before crossing the Swedish border. 
There was no prejudice in the decision, only technicalities within the visa process itself. After Abraham's admission, Johannes was eventually released from the police custody and was removed as a suspect. His name was officially cleared. Interrogations with Abraham continued as hundreds of witnesses were also interviewed. One of these witnesses was Janice, the nurse who attempted to provide assistance to Carola and Emil. She, along with many of the people interviewed by the police, stated that they'd only become aware of the situation when Carola screams. However, those who had seen the attacks unfold entirely were able to confirm to the police that it was only Abraham who had attacked Carola and Emil, not Johannes. The investigation then turned to focus on the evidence collected from the IKEA show floor. They knew what had happened and who had done it. Now investigators were determined to collect as much evidence forensically as possible to ensure that he did not get off easy. Fingerprints and DNA evidence, as well as CCTV footage, played a major part in the process, allowing the investigators to prove without a reasonable doubt what had happened. While Abraham and Johannes were both under police custody, rumours about what had happened inside the IKEA in Vastaros were spreading like wildfires online. Because of the nature of the incident, many people took interest in the case as it developed, causing it to gain a major online media attention in the days that followed. And as we all know, this isn't always a good thing. Various accounts across social media online began to share versions of what they'd heard happened, or what they believed had happened with many of these accounts being baseless and outrageously incorrect. A popular and particularly disturbing rumour in regards to the killings is that Abraham had beheaded Carola and Emil whilst yelling religious sayings. This rumour has several versions to it as well, with different religions being associated with the misinformation, causing certain groups to be associated with the killing who had nothing to do with it. Another rumour was that it had been an act of terrorism, and that obviously was not the case. Regardless of how baseless and outlandish the rumours were, they continued to spread and were eventually picked up by big media sites within Sweden. Many places were desperate for information on the case, as it was a popular search term in the days after the attacks. For obvious reasons, the police were not releasing new information on the case, meaning the media at the time only had the original information to run on their sites. And these reruns of the original information began to lose public interest, and some media sites were scouring for more information. What they found instead was the misinformation circulating online. Some of them ran it anyway, despite the glaring inconsistencies and anti-immigrant rhetoric laced throughout the false claims. Major media outlets shared these rumours regardless. The social and political landscapes of Sweden at the time were not particularly friendly to immigrants due to what was considered a, quote, immigration crisis within the country. So the addition of what can only be described as malicious anti-immigrant rumours added to the mix only furthered this tension. It wasn't until the police spoke up to dispel these rumours that they stopped being spread. This terrifying development might seem quite minor in the terms of the overall case, but the danger it put other immigrants in was very real. The media frenzy and subsequent spread of misinformation around this case would eventually go on to prompt investigations into the Swedish media and conspiracies in general. The sharing of conspiracy rhetoric became much more moderated in the years following the incident. There was valid concern that the media around this case could have caused issues with Abraham's trial. However, due to how transparent it was that he'd committed the crimes, it wasn't as much of an issue as it would have been in other cases. His trial was less about proving that he'd killed Carola and Emil Herlin, and more about what should be done about it. Abraham's hope was to remain in Sweden, even if it was in the form of imprisonment. After being ordered to leave the country and committing two senseless murders, Abraham still somehow believed that he'd be allowed to remain in the country. Obviously, this would not be the outcome of the trial and sentencing. In October of 2015, after interviewing the witnesses and presenting evidence analysed by various experts, the court decided Abraham's fate. Abraham would be deported back to Italy, where he still had a residence permit, and remain in prison until the day of his deportation. Abraham tried on many occasions to appeal this before the date of his deportation, but 
as one would expect, was not successful in those appeals. In December of 2015, the court upheld and finalized the sentencing. While he was awaiting deportation in Swedish prison, he was attacked multiple times. Finally, after around two years of being in Sweden, Abraham was deported back to Italy, which was where he still had a right to residence. He was subsequently barred from re-entering Sweden. It was over. There is very little publicly available information about Carola and Emil's lives, and in order to preserve the privacy of them and their family, we chose to leave it be. What we do know is that Carola and Emil were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. That the misplaced anger of one man took a mother and son away from the people that they loved. Abraham Ugbagabir did not take the proper steps to ensure his visa would be approved, and when he was made aware of that fact, he decided to punish two strangers and their families because of it. In the hours following the attacks, IKEA released a statement to the international community saying, quote, Earlier this afternoon, a tragic incident occurred at the IKEA store in Vastros, Sweden, approximately 100 kilometers west of Stockholm. For the time being, we can confirm that two of the victims sadly have passed away and one is severely injured, being treated at hospital. The store is currently closed, as well as the entire Eriksland shopping center where the store is located. Police are investigating at the site. At this time, our thoughts go to the victims and their families. The IKEA in Vastaros would eventually set up a memorial to Carola and Emil outside of the store where visitors could leave flowers and gifts to honor them. There was also a book in which they could write letters of condolences to the family allowing the Herlands to remember that the community was there to support them. Abraham's actions and subsequent media-fed conspiracies also led to many repercussions for immigrants within Sweden. Only a few days after the attack in Ikea, police and Vastros were called to the very same Ikea that the attack had occurred in. A group of anti-immigrant protesters had gathered there to demand that immigrants not be allowed in the country anymore claiming that the immigrants coming into Sweden were inherently bad for Swedish citizens. This notion was not only xenophobic, but also entirely unfounded and incorrect. Not only had Abraham's actions destroyed a family, they had also caused a fresh new wave of panic and distrust amongst immigrants, who had absolutely nothing to do with the entire ordeal. It's heartbreaking to know that one man could cause so much heartbreak and pain over selfish and misplaced anger. And that brings us to the end of this case. What are your thoughts on today's case? Let me know in the comment section down below. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new True Crime video, just like this one. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.